I'm Nicholas Bernhard, and welcome to the second annual NDH Films interview. I am very excited to have our guest tonight, someone who has worked in really every medium of popular culture. He's worked in movies, video games, television, comic books, radio, and live theater. We're very happy to have him here tonight, so please join me in welcoming Mr. Hal Robbins. Well, thank you, Nicholas. I hope you'll be equally happy at the end of the session. people know you as the voice of Dr. Kleiner in the Half-Life series, Yes. but they may not know that you had actually uh, written and starred in a, in a movie, a Chameleons, and that was 1989. My friend, uh, Bob Chi, uh, who is a gentleman living in San Francisco, wanted to make uh, a movie, and um, several scripts were produced for it. Uh, none of them were satisfactory. Finally, uh, Michael Anderson began a draft that he and I finished, and uh, we thought it had enough humor in it to, to go ahead. Sam, congratulate me. I've done it. I've done it. I've been in resonance with an alien plenum for, for, for 18 minutes now. Look in the viewport. The viewport. Oh, over here. Oh, no, wait a minute. What am I doing? Forget about the viewport. Uh, go over there and uh, check the emission counter. Uh, check the emission counter. Oh, I, I, no, wait, 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 wait. I, I could just balance it from over here. Uh, check the monitor. You stay on the monitor. Dad, slow down a minute. I haven't understood a word you said. Aren't you paying attention? A three-year-old could understand this. I'm talking about an infinitely stretched plasmoid bubble sustaining itself from nanosecond to nanosecond. It's that simple. Our budget was never great. It was a million dollars, uh, roughly. But we thought that although we would not be able to uh, duplicate the slickness that the great studios bring, perhaps if we had something in the script that would be unusual, that would be a value that would carry us through. Unfortunately, there were a number of uh, people working on the film who thought all of those things were very un-Hollywood and did their best to cut them down, leaving us with a much weaker entry than we would have otherwise. And I understand that the director of Chameleons, Michael Anderson, uh, we went on to become a director on The Simpsons. A supervising animation director, and I believe Michael's name is on just about every episode of The Simpsons that comes out now. We, Michael and I, have eventual hopes, perhaps, of uh, restoring the movie. I pay each month for 90-odd uh, reels of film to be stored in the vault in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. If I stopped paying, they'd be thrown out. The version that you might see, which can be completely seen online, is very unfair to uh, Kathleen Beeler's cinematography. The color timing seems atrocious, and it was much better done originally. But matters get out of your hands, mm -hmm. and uh, there's not much you can do about that. One thing uh, when I was watching the movie is that you've got all these, these people running around this house. There's a birthday party. There's misunderstandings. Mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of romance. It really seems like more like a comedic farce, like Much Ado About Nothing, more yes. than a B-horror film. The setup of farce is there. Michael Anderson and me understood this, but not many others did. The producers, only familiar with uh, uh, kung fu films, certainly did not. Uh, some people we would tell to act in a certain way, and they would say, well, I just don't see it that way. You know, and, mm -hmm. uh, we couldn't explain why. And uh, the result, as you've seen, is somewhat uneven. I see Lovecraft um, as an influence on the movie. You've got names like Pikmin. Uh, there's Miskatonic University. Um, yes. There's the idea of other dimensions. And what Once I was again, only a few people even knew what this was about, and others thought it, it meaningless. And uh, uh, they would cut out what we would put in. But uh, and some of it is, remains in. What is it about Lovecraft that, that has given his work such longevity? What uh, strikes me about it is that there is a back story of cosmic awareness, which is completely at odds with Lovecraft's stature as a regional writer, which he also was. But he also had an interest in astronomy and in uh, the great length of time uh, that it took to create the universe and other scientific facts. 
which uh, for him were uh, used as a basis of supernatural horror and nobody had really done that to any degree before he came along and other writers have just not been able to resist continuing this and uh, building on the mythos and even our movie does in some small part. Mm -hmm. What's the key difference between what we would see on like a VHS edition of Chameleons and, and what you and Anderson uh, could release in a perfect world? Well, uh, there were more scenes because we went outside our set in Emeryville to, uh, it's important, uh, I never could make uh, the people who were cutting the film down understand that you want to open up so you don't feel so claustrophobic, just to have exteriors, to be outside. Uh, my late mm -hmm. brother appeared in uh, them and did a, a comic turn. Um, I'm sorry that that is gone and it would be great to restore it. We were living in San Francisco, and Mark Laidlaw was in San Francisco at the same time. He was, yes, he, he was lived within walking distance of me at that time. And he had written some books, one, one very Lovecraftian in nature, The 37th Mandala. Mm -hmm. I illustrated that, or I did some illustrations for it. Ah, but by his account, he got called up to Seattle mm -hmm. uh, to, to work with this new software company, Valve. Yes. And so how did you become involved with the Half-Life series? Well, he, uh, perhaps he'd seen the Chameleon's material, I don't know, or he might have been familiar with my stage and nightclub work, which I was doing even then. Uh, so I was cast in this uh, wonderful and amusing part of uh, Dr. Isaac Kleiner. And the recording sessions actually allowed me to do a little free association and uh, contribution of my own. So. Uh, that was a, a privilege which I took advantage of. Was there any difference from your perspective between uh, working with Valve on the first game and then Gearbox for the expansion packs? Only that uh, a lot more care was taken as uh, we went on to do multiple takes and to provide all sorts of possible shades of recording that could be used. Um, as an actor, what do you look for in a director? What sort of uh, guidance is effective and what, what isn't? Well, uh, as long as uh, I'm able to, uh, to make a suggestion, uh, then I feel that I won't be bounded by a setup that lets me be less than fully expressive. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess a good director will uh, treat you as though you have something to contribute. And then, who knows, you might. Now, I, I've heard um, Alan McLean, another a wonderful voice actor um, in the, for, for Valve. Yes. Um, she has said that what's great about Valve's direction to voice actors is this very specific. Uh, like, they'll say things like, you know, they want explosive indignation. And or, that's good, because uh, it saves you time in trying to come up with it yourself. They know better than you what they want. You know, you give them that, and then you bring uh, elements of your own personality into it, which humanizes it. Mm -hmm. So they're really doing it right, uh, than to say, oh, just see what you can come up with. Uh, you might get something good, but uh, mm -hmm. it's always best to have artistic direction, to, to know what you want from the beginning. Alongside Dr. Kleiner, um, a lot of people know you as the keeper of secrets. The master of church secrets. Master of church secrets in the Church of the Subgenius. Yes. And so, how, and so that was founded in 79, and you joined a bit later. Uh, could you tell me a little bit about that? Doug Smith, uh, whose church name is Ivan Stang, uh, and uh, his friend Steve Wilcox, whose church name is Philo Drummond, uh, began producing the subgenius material at that time in Dallas, Texas, and they produced pamphlet number one, which has all of the principles in it, and you can still get it from the church. Now, at that time, I was involved in drawing uh, the underground comic books. The head of ripoff at the time, uh, Fred Todd, looked at it and uh, didn't uh, think it was worth anything and tossed it in the trash which was where Paul Mavritas found it and pulled it out. And both he and I thought it was hilarious. And we contacted the uh, 
uh, sub-geniuses. Uh, first uh, Paul uh, met them, and then they came out to San Francisco and I met them. And, uh, and now uh, I'm thoroughly enmeshed with them. In fact, each year I go to X Day, the sub-genius national uh, convocation in, mm -hmm. uh, in southern Ohio. The, the jungles of, of southern Ohio. The steaming it. tropical jungles of southern Ohio. It's hot there, I got to tell you. The concept of slack, which Very is really at, at the heart of, of the subgenius. Yes, it is. What would be your explanation for what slack is? Well, I'll uh, give you the uh, 25 cent uh, dime store explanation. Okay. Um, you were born with original slack. But there is an entity in the world today called the conspiracy that wants to take your slack away and sell you false slack and to keep you working uh, for a living to purchase uh, meaningless uh, tchotchkes and uh, these can only grant false slack and meaningless leisure. But true slack can be anything which provides you with that particular benefit. Slack, as its name suggests, is the opposite of tension and uh, promotes leisure, the basis of culture. Only in the slack time, your off time, when you slack off, can you come up with something that is valuable. While you're working for the conspiracy, you can only continue to build that particular edifice, which we say uh, is rotten at the base and will all crumble at some time. But uh, slackful uh, procedures will produce a slackful result. Okay, with your work in comics, uh, you became interested in Jack Chick. You appeared in the documentary God's Cartoonist to talk yes. about. For those who haven't seen them, these are small uh, comic books which are usually handed to you at airports or, or left... Uh, at air? Really? Well, they're left in bus stations or some place where people may find them and be saved. Since Chick, a fundamentalist Christian, really believes that most people are going to hell and they just need to read a Chick tract or two and that will set them on the right path. And uh, actually, people do find them and people are convinced by them, particularly if you read a lot of them by the end of the evening, you'll start to think maybe you should get down on your knees and kowtow to Jesus and maybe avoid the fiery pit Chick is an underground cartoonist. He is. He is he's, uh, he's the most published underground cartoonist of all time. And he's how can he not be since his work sells for 14 cents or whatever it is, unlike like other comic books, of, uh, which are copy. more expensive. And today, a few people buy comic books because they don't flash or blink or have ads in the margins or, or whatever. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, now the, uh, the more ordained uh, conspiracy type comic books are being mined as a basis for enormous and heavily profitable movies and that oh, actually yes. now that uh, tale is wagging the comic book dog it wouldn't oh, have yes. existence without that i really think that like uh, in hollywood they, they view comic books as prefab storyboards yes. and they are that's a beautiful way to produce storyboards uh, Comic books are telling, uh, comic strips tell stories in sequential form, mm -hmm. and uh, they must set up the views in order to convey the information. Mm -hmm. uh, storyboards resemble comic books. There was one I read, um, A Little Princess, oh, uh, yes. where the, the girl is dying of cancer and... That maudlin that note often uh, comes into them. They, it yeah. gets worse <laughs> than that, actually. Uh, as far as the uh, bathos is concerned, but nothing is uh, beyond the chicks. Uh, uh and and she goes out. Her last wish is like trick or treat, and there's the evangelist next door, and they and they witness for her. What you say? There's a Jehovah's Witness who won't give his child a blood transfusion. I'll I'll send Bob right over, and he'll uh, he'll argue that you know. Uh -huh. Uh, what? You say they're teaching evolution in this school? Uh, we'll send or a guy over. Actually, Chick gets out of control and the, the prose gets more and more on the pages and the comics diminish more and more until finally there are a few drawings of heads and a huge ream of anti-Catholic diatribe or anti-Muslim, anti-Buddhist, anti-Jehovah's anti Witness, uh, uh, whatever, anti-everything. 
What is something that people can do right now to reduce stress in their lives? Well, they can uh, realize that the lure of the conspiracy is a false one, and that although the conspiracy's main promise always seems somewhat convincing since you encounter it everywhere, if you analyze it, it's not so convincing. What they're telling you is that if you only buy one more doodad or tchotchke, that will complete your life and you will have slack, you will have happiness. Not so much happiness, but, uh, but you know, it will complete you. It will make you what you want to be. But of course you get that and then you realize, no, the goal is still farther off. You still have to get something else. Getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Little we see in nature that is ours. But on the other hand, if you're searching for your own personal satisfaction and following your uh, own uh, bent, you have a greater chance of being satisfied and ultimately being a more integrated personality and happier person. What's the greatest gift that someone can receive in their lifetime? Uh, I think to be able to do what one sets out to do and not be diverted into another path and okay. to learn whether or not it works uh, rightly or wrongly. My last question, I wanted to take a page from the film critic Gene Siskel and ask, um, what do you know for sure? What do you know for sure in, in your life? Um, well, uh, I suppose basic uh, scientific facts uh, are sure at a certain level. But beyond that, uh, we must uh, choose to uh, believe what sources we seek out. But the one thing that seems fairly sure is the uh, Socratic admonition to know yourself, know thyself. Uh, if you know what your own uh, feelings and desires are, you'll have a much better opportunity of trying to satisfy them. So one should uh, look unflinchingly as one can at one's own self. And I'll just throw in that we subgeniuses believe that this is what the universe intends. If you want a meaning, if you want the meaning of life, uh, that's what it is. The universe is developing this small pocket of matter that organizes itself in a greater universe of disorganization and entropy. This organization will eventually be able to look at itself uh, and to know itself. So this is the, the purpose that things are moving toward. Um, hi Hal, who was your role model growing up? Who was your role model growing up? Who was my role model growing up? You know, I was uh, a monster kid, if you know who they are. People who uh, fetishized and deeply studied monster movies. The first stage of Bull Dada is studying monster movies. Any monster magazine, I or my friends could find at convenience stores, were sacred and holy texts. So, on the basis of that, I think uh, my childhood hero, and still my hero as an adult, was uh, stop-motion animator Ray Harryhausen. Although uh, ostensibly a technician, they're really his movies. And yes. in his last movie, he's not doing a, a special effects for a movie with Laurence Olivier so much as Laurence Olivier is in one of his crazy movies with mm -hmm. animated monsters. When you see a monster in his movies, it's really there. Yes. Uh, yes. And it's also interesting to realize that the monster, although it appears to be behind things and in the picture, is really in the foreground. And that when it walks behind something, that's because part of the image is matted away. Before we uh, move on, to we go back to the questions. There was one thing I wanted to ask your, your thoughts on regarding these, these special effects. Um, I've heard said that uh, classical special effects in movies like Harryhausen's would show you something the way you imagined it would look. And modern day special effects, the CGI, shows you things as they would, as they would actually be in real life. 
like if they actually existed. Uh, do you think that there's anything to that? Yes, I do, uh, because you're seeing an artistic vision on one hand, the analog special effect, and in the modern uh, computer-generated effect, you're seeing something which is kind of determined by a committee. Uh, Harryhausen didn't even know what his uh, film would look like when it came back from the lab. Uh, he had a pretty good idea, mm -hmm. uh, and he used all the tricks of film editing. But uh, today, you can see it instantly, and then you can tweak it, and you can keep tweaking it until mm -hmm. everybody is satisfied. Yes. But when everybody is satisfied, there's less of an opportunity for the uh, vision of one person to predominate. But there's no reason that uh, it has to be that way. This right. is the, the organization of film studios, and a strong enough uh, director can use the marvelous ability of uh, computer-generated effects to, to do it. It's just it's hard to make it out of committee. Even right. in the little film that I made, uh, you really have to struggle to get your uh, mm -hmm. intent known. All right. What's next? All right. Um, if Half-Life 3 was announced, oh boy. would you still do the voice of Dr. Kleiner? I'd be very happy to if I were asked uh, to do it. Uh, I'm not the one who makes those decisions, but... Uh, I'm eternally standing by to resume that role, which it's an honor to have been able to do. How is Paul Maverides as a housemate? He's uh, uh, definitely someone who wants to do things uh, in uh, the way that he envisages. So uh, he's got a very strong artistic personality and uh, uh, will fight for his uh, view of, of things. but. Uh, uh, he's not inflexible, and uh, he's also a realist, which is uh, another good thing which can be said about him. What's coming up? Hi. Nicholas Cage, yay or nay? Nicholas Cage, fan or not? Mm, I think he's uh, dedicated. He's not just phoning it in. Uh, sure. Uh, and anybody seen <laughs> Vampire's Kiss? He really does pick up a cockroach and eat it. You yeah. know, that takes dedication. <laughs> And, you know, i got to say, you know, I can't think of any other actor who invests himself 100% into every role, no matter how bad the movie is. Even it's, where he plays the flaming skull guy who rides the oh, motorcycle? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like, he, he gets so into character. That's the way to do it. That's what they're paying you for. Yeah. Uh, there's no point. there. You can't be inhibited. You have to, to put everything you can out there. If you're going to eat crap, don't nibble. Yeah. You know, they say. Uh, or as we say in the Church of the Subgenius, don't just eat a hamburger, eat the hell out of it. Yeah. Um, all right, what's, what's next? Nooch wants you to tell him a secret. Hmm, what can I say? Well, I, there are a lot of secrets I, I can say, but uh, the problem with them is they're secret for a reason, and uh, when you... Uh, when you say them, uh, you disappoint people because you disabuse them of their uh, beliefs. So what can I say? Vikings didn't have horns on their helmets. Uh, it's all terrible. People are, are disappointed if I, if, I, uh, <laughs> if I let it all out. But one thing I'll, I'll say is that uh, uh, the, the matter that you see as established that uh, dinosaurs had feathers is not established, uh, nor is it even really probable. But you have to study it so hard to, to find this out that uh, most yeah. people are willing just to uh, just listen to this dogma. And I'm probably infuriating all sorts of people by mentioning this. So I hope this satisfies uh, the yes. question. <laughs> It is, it's, these secrets are not uh, uh, completely secret, but the conspiracy uh, makes them so concealed that they might as well be secrets. Uh -huh. Yes. Um, all right, what's next on the questions? Okay, in many ways you seem anti-authoritarian, but in the interview you mentioned that in the filmmaking world, following authority is a must. To what end is this true? Well, uh, the more a film respects the vision of its creators, 
the more that vision will come out. And uh, in the middle of somebody else's shoot, it's not really the time to push for your own uh, program. If you're lucky, you may get to be at a point where you can uh, promulgate your own uh, aesthetic vision. But to try to do it in the middle of somebody else's idea is not cohesive. Just like in the world of the theater, where you make the other actors look good, then you look good. If you are a grandstander, then the whole ep thing will look uh, rinky-dink and amateur uh, theatrical. You know, it, uh, you have to have the ensemble spirit to support the enterprise. Mm -hmm. Filmmaking is a great enterprise involving all sorts of uh, different people, and they're always trying to. Uh, the money people, particularly, are always trying to. Uh, dumb it down and uh, make it more acceptable to stadium-sized audiences. The problem with that is that we can't really predict, even with our superior science of demographics, what's going to catch on and strike an imaginative response. That is what an artist does. Yes. How realistic is it for a middle-aged guy to make a career move into voice work? What areas are most in demand these days? Video games, television productions, animated movies? Well, they might want a middle-aged sounding voice, and then you'd be just right. They don't want everyone to be a young voice. I have discovered that the voice that is the most in demand is one that's almost impossible to produce. But if you can produce it, you can, uh, you can write your own ticket. And this is what the is voice it? of the normal guy, normal <laughs> Joe. It's not the character voices. Uh, it's not the weird accents and funny voices. You have to convince in an instant that who's listening uh, to you is listening to the average person, uh, the blank uh, uh, canvas on whom your own personality can be projected. And there are people who have developed this to a high skill. You should have in your repertoire the everyday voice, if you can produce it, because no one knows what it is. Only a producer will recognize it and say, that's what I'm looking for. Hi, Hal. Fascinating interview. I had a two-part question. What is your stance on the Schuster-Siegel lawsuit revolving around the rights and property of Superman, and does the theory of slack from the church go against the acquisition of collectibles, or is it justified if that type of acquisition brings happiness and nostalgia? Yes, I am the guy in the glasses and pie shirt. <laughs> Do you want to repeat the question before I answer? <laughs> or uh, uh, should I summarize the question as I answer? Right, well, I think this is a multi-parter. Well, I, uh, I haven't followed it closely enough to know. I'm surprised if that lawsuit still exists. But, you know, it probably should because you have these two guys in New York who create Superman, the most popular comic character ever, and are paid a hundred dollars by DC Comics and told, okay, get out of here, you know. When they came up with it, they should have benefited from it. And finally, years later, DC gave them or their heirs uh, some big chunk of change. But uh, on the other hand, um, you know, this is the classic story of the exploitation of the little guy by the cigar-chewing money men. Uh, the novel the Adventures of Cavalier and Clay, uh, you may be f familiar with, uh, is, uh, is somewhat about this. If the suit still exists, I think uh, DC, particularly with the recent movies, can afford to give the heirs some recognition for what they did. Now, the other part of this question was, what? does collecting objects uh, attract, uh, I and mean, does it uh, increase slack or um, uh, uh, detract from it? There is a way in which it might detract from it. Uh, in order to lie down and sleep at, at night, I have to move hundreds of pounds of books and plastic dinosaurs off my bed. But to, uh, but to pass that, uh, uh, in many subgenius households, you see what we call slack altars, where are, there are these large collections of things from, you know, salvaged from the pop culture underground. And that's one sign of, uh, of a potential subgenius, that there will be these slack altars, which can threaten to take over uh, 
the living space. But uh, they have a, a great use if these forms, these shapes and objects can stimulate the original thoughts which they produced. And in most cases, they absolutely can. I'm very happy to look at my large uh, collection of, of prehistoric uh, uh, miniatures uh, because they can be viewed in different dimensions and they stimulate the thought on the subject. That's just where I am, but other people collect uh, speedy Alka-Seltzer statues, Bosco statues, or whatever. There's a, you know, a popular culture produced uh, enormous uh, layers of things and they each has a symbolic meaning perhaps not originally intended by the manufacturer or the originator. Art is synthesis and creates out of fusion of these uh, things, of, of what it is given. You know, uh, the uh, old masters were only given religious subjects to come up with their, uh, uh, their paintings, but uh, in our world of media f of all different directions and types, uh, we have a greater opportunity to create new things, and it's something which we should embrace rather than throw up our hands in despair. The old can always be made new again. What it needs is energy and creative vision.